Hey, Joel, thanks for joining us to talk about eccentric training and how that can be used for performance gains. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to this very much. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Let's start out. Let's uh, define some basic terms to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page. Can you talk to us about what concentric, eccentric, and isometric muscle contractions are? Yeah, so let's just start with, uh, you know, typical concentric movement. Concentric movement, also oftentimes thought of as the positive phase of a lifting movement. Um, It's basically where if we're doing a bench press, you're lifting the weight back up to the top or you're pressing it on a bench press or you're squatting back up to the top of the squat or pull up to pull down, you're pulling uh, the bar close to your chest. That's typically what's thought of with a concentric movement, and that's the case where the muscles are shortening during the uh, motion. The eccentric is kind of the opposite. Eccentric motions are when the muscles are basically lengthening during the movement, and that's often thought of as the lowering phase or the negative of a movement. So, for again, we're going back to a bench press scenario. It's you know when uh, an individual would lower the barbell to their chest, that is the eccentric component, or again, on a squat where they would lower into the bottom position. Isometric, isometrics are a little bit more tricky to define um, just in terms of a simple uh, one definition, but they're typically when there is no movement involved, but the muscle is contracting forcefully. Um, there's overcoming isometrics, there's uh, yielding isometrics, and then as in the case that we're going to talk about today, we have eccentric isometrics, but again, the muscle is producing force but it's not moving. That is the definition of an isometric. Great. So eccentric training, how is that typically used in the gym and what are the benefits of typical eccentric training? Yeah. So, I mean, eccentric training has been around now for well over a decade. There's been a lot of research on just typical eccentric training. A lot of the times you'll see super maximal loads used in research. And again, um, super maximal just meaning higher than your one repetition max. So, there may, it may be a device that's set up, or you may have two spotters on each side. So, again, we'll go back to the bench press scenario where the partner or the device will lift the weight up for the individual, but then they'll lower it very slowly using a very heavy load. And there's a lot of micro trauma, a lot of muscle damage, a lot of mechanical tension involved. And those are thought to be very beneficial for producing hypertrophy, strength, um, restructuring of the muscle itself, um, also injury prevention, a lot of benefits. Uh, for sports as well as uh, as well as physique benefits, so um, that's typically you know, and, and again, it doesn't have to necessarily be super maximal loads. Um, you know, just simply performing the eccentric movement maybe a little bit slower. Um, there's lots of ways that you can kind of emphasize the eccentric movement itself. Now, the the eccentric portion of a lift that's what's typically going to cause a little bit more of that soreness, right? Exactly. That's where we get that little bit of, of micro trauma, that muscular damage, and, and yeah, that's where we get the muscle soreness or that delayed onset muscle soreness that uh, <laughs> some people love more than others. But uh, as, as I think most of us in the industry uh, can affirm to, it's kind of a pleasant experience because you know some good things are typically happening. Yeah, but that also means it's kind of important to pay attention to where you put that in your cycle, especially if you're an athlete, right? 100%. Yeah, you don't want to be uh, inducing too much eccentric damage on the muscles. You know, if it's in season or right before the season, it can definitely um, impair force production for uh, several days up to several weeks. In fact, you have to be very careful with eccentric movements. And in fact, you can overdo it on eccentric movements or you can actually um, atrophy a muscle because it's been overly stressed and overly damaged. So, yeah, that's going to be careful. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to pop in, Zach. In my observations and experience, especially with beginners, I try to make sure their program doesn't have a good component of eccentrics because I know that's going to bring the soreness early. And so I'd rather them kind of ease into it before we get anything like that. And even just with them doing normal movements, that's the part of the exercise that especially beginners tend to go quick through when, as we're talking about here, there's a lot of benefits from that, even if they just have the concentric and eccentric be the same tempo, if not eccentric a little slower. Yeah, no, you're right. It's kind of a tricky scenario. I mean, you have a you know a beginner, and we haven't got too much into you know the the eccentric isometrics themselves. But you know, um, obviously, from a standpoint of reinforcing the ideal movement patterns into someone's nervous system, and teaching them proper mechanics. You know, you want them to go slow, but at the same time, their bodies are not adapted to the stress of eccentric motion. So you have to find that balance between. Uh, using the eccentrics to promote ideal movement mechanics, but not getting them so sore that it's uh, 
you know, going to you know, basically delay um, their experience in terms of learning the movements or just messing with their overall muscle function for several days. So you mentioned eccentric isometrics, which is kind of what you've really brought out. Can you define for people what eccentric isometrics are? Yeah. Um, so basically an eccentric isometric um, describes a movement where the eccentric phase is performed in a very slow and very deliberate fashion, usually lasting three to five seconds. Um, and during that time, the lifter is um, not just going through the motions, but they're focused on fine-tuning their movement mechanics and in enhancing their the quality of their movement pattern by using the sensory feedback um, that's coming through their proprioceptive mechanisms. So, um, and then again, that's followed pretty much immediately by a pause or isometric in the stretch position. And again, that's kind of where the name eccentric isometric comes from. You know, you have that pause or hold or isometric in the stretch position. You would hold that for two to seven seconds. Um, and again, in that case, the lifter is not just pausing, again, for the sake of pausing, but they're trying to hold that position that should be ideal or proper if they did the eccentric portion right. They're trying to hold that as a means of reinforcing the ideal mechanics into their central nervous system and basically re-educating their nervous system with proper technique. And then um, finally, it's completed with just a very powerful and forceful concentric phase where they explosively and powerfully um, drive the weight back up. So that's pretty, that's pretty much, again, um, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and we're, we're, I'm sure we'll get into that um, in terms of why it's done like that, what's happening uh, intramuscularly, not just on the surface. You know, what we see externally, there's a lot more to it than that. Okay. So when they're doing that isometric contraction, so they've done a, they've done a three to five second eccentric, and then they're doing that two to seven second isometric contraction. Where are they at? They're not like rock bottom of a squat or just hanging from the pull up bar, right? Exactly. This is this is something that um, you know. I remember when I first started talking about eccentric isometrics, I had certain people, you know, writing to me and telling me, "Hey, you know, I was doing eccentric isometrics. So I got to the very bottom of this position." And then they would even send me either pictures or videos you know, asking for my advice. And one thing that I noticed right off the bat is everyone thinks that, you know, the eccentric isometric um, is basically you just collapse into the bottom position. And that is totally not what an eccentric isometric is because that's actually a faulty movement um, and dysfunctional movement that we don't want to occur. The goal is to basically stay as tight as possible and to have enhanced muscle stiffness while you basically lower into the uh, most natural and strongest bottom position. So we're looking for optimal range of motion, not excessive range of motion. I guess that's what I'm getting at. So can I get jump in here, guys? Because I'm, I'm new to this too. And I'm just thinking, so like with a squat, we're, we may not be even going down to parallel if we're putting these in the program. Then. Am I thinking through that right? Yeah, it's going to be somewhere around about a parallel position is what okay. we're looking for. Maybe a tiny bit above, maybe slightly below, depending on the individual and their, you know, various anthropometric differences, but it's certainly not going to be where you just go as deep as you can right. possibly go. Because one of the things here that there's, you know, if we think about, um, I guess this is maybe a little bit early to get into it, but, you know, it sounds like as good a time as ever. Um, there's multiple things that have to occur um, for a proper eccentric isometric to happen. So, if we're, if we're the whole reason behind the eccentric isometric is that when a muscle is stretched, that's where you get enhanced feedback from something called a muscle spindle or an intrafusal muscle fiber. And muscle spindles are these little mechanisms that are embedded into muscles themselves, and they provide lots of sensory feedback about our body positioning, about our movement mechanics. Um, it happens uh, very deep within the central nervous system. Um, and we can use all of that information, all that sensory information to make adjustments and to fine tune our body positioning. So that's why we're going slow. That's why we're emphasizing the eccentric motion because during the eccentric, that's when the muscle is stretched. And when a muscle is stretched, that's when we get muscle spindle recruitment. When we get muscle spindle recruitment, that's how we can fine tune our movement where we don't even have to listen to kind of what a coach is saying. We can listen to what our body's telling us and we can make the necessary adjustments. But there's multiple things that have to occur to activate a muscle spindle properly and to, to have a proper eccentric isometric. Um, number one, you have to have proper spinal alignment. So if we're talking about a squat, 
if you go down so deep that, you know, you, you know, I guess you've, everyone's kind of heard of the term butt wink or basically the spine collapses, it goes into flexion. Um, you are not getting optimal recruitment of muscle spindles and you're basically defeating the purpose because you're short circuiting neural signals that are coming from the spine. Okay. So that's one of the most important things. The other thing is obviously the muscles have to be stretched. We're in the eccentric position. Um, as the muscles stretch though, there's several other factors that have to occur. There has to be a very high level of um, co-contraction of agonist and antagonist muscles or co-contraction or co-activation of reciprocal muscle groups. And what I mean by that is, again, maybe go back to a bench press example. It's not just a matter of having the weight collapse and come down. It's a matter of actually using your back muscles, which are your antagonist in this case, to pull you into proper position. This creates maximal um, uh, stiffness in the muscle. And stiffness is a very, very important aspect of eccentric isometrics because stiffness is critical for muscle spindle activation. So you can't have good uh, activation of those intrafusal muscle fibers or muscle spindles without a high level of stiffness, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I kind of threw out a lot of information there. We can kind of go back to some of those things and um, explore them further, but uh, that's, you know, some of those are very critical. So one of the reasons why I use this a lot, for me, it's cleaned up a lot of mobility mistakes in patients and clients that I work with. How do you right. implement that in people who are struggling mobility-wise? Right. So this is a this is an interesting question. Um, so it's basically eccentric isometrics are excellent um, for mobility for for a number of reasons, but it's not just a case where hey somebody um, you know they don't have good mobility. What's going on here? Um, you know, we got to stretch them out. So what can happen with someone in terms of not having optimal mobility, there's two kind of, uh, areas we can look at. One is they have excessive mobility. Okay. They have hypermobility. This is actually something I see just as much as not having enough mobility. So if we address it from that standpoint, the eccentric isometrics help to increase muscle stiffness and joint stability. So instead of the person just collapsing into the bottom of a position, which is very common, if somebody doesn't have good motor control or muscle control, they'll just collapse. So eccentric isometrics greatly help with that. The other thing, though, you know, we commonly think of, you know, lack of mobility is in terms of being the biggest mobility issue. Well, oftentimes a person uh, may be lacking mobility, not simply because the muscle is just stiff and they don't have the flexibility, but um, their bodies may not allow them to go through a certain range of motion that they can't stabilize properly because it's going to produce too much uh, pain and inflammation and tension on the connective tissue and the tendons and ligaments. So their bodies will basically inhibit that movement. But again, eccentric isometrics teach proper positioning, proper mechanics. So instead of having that inhibition from the nervous system, their bodies are free to move through an optimal range of motion. So yeah, I mean, using them for mobility is, is huge. And I think that's definitely one of the biggest areas. So yeah, I think you, you hit it on the head. Yeah, I love using it on both sides of the spectrum as well. It really helps people kind of own those difficult positions to get into. Um, exactly. and, and it can be super, super powerful in getting people just moving better, understanding things a lot better. I've heard you also yeah. say you like to do these without vision. Can you go into that a little but, bit? Ah, uh, yes, without vision. <laughs> the, uh, the, some of my athletes like to say they're training like a ninja, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of a similar concept. Um, a lot of martial artists, um, they kind of inherently do without even knowing why exactly. But, um, so basically what's going on with, again, with any eccentric isometrics, it's all about tuning into the proprioceptive feedback from uh, the various mechanisms of our body and from our muscles, like the muscle spindles, like I mentioned. When there's uh, vision present or if the individual is too distracted by the visual uh, feedback that's coming through, they can oftentimes neglect and fail to adhere to the proprioceptive sensory feedback that's coming to the muscle. So the vision can kind of act as a distraction. What I typically tell my athletes and clients, I want them to feel their way through the movement, not watch their way through the movement. The, the uh, power of feel is a lot more powerful than uh, sight, and you can tune into a lot of what's going on. If you simply just eliminate the visual component, have them close their eyes, 
oftentimes it will make it a little bit more difficult at first, but it allows the individual to really tune in to all that sensory feedback, the somatosensory feedback that's coming through the muscle spindle, then they can fine tune the position. A lot of the times we'll have an athlete, you know, they'll do a squat and say, for example, their knees are collapsing or they'll have a little bit of ankle pronation. They may not feel it and I may, you know, call it to their attention. And I'll say, okay, I want you to close your eyes, go really slow on the way down on this. I want you to feel what's going on with your knees and your ankle. I won't even tell them specifically what to feel for. And then I'll have them do two or three reps. We'll rack the weight. I'll say, okay, what'd you feel? And they told me, and as a result, they were actually able to clean up the movement themselves without me having to give them much coaching because they could feel what was going on since they basically enhanced proprioceptive feedback from eliminating the visual distraction. That's really cool. And, and, and like you said, Joel, it makes sense. If, if they shut off the, the visual system there, which gives so much feedback and sometimes too much, then they can exactly. hopefully get inside themselves more and really focus on making those connections that you're trying to get anyway with doing a technique like this. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. And I think that what you just said was a very um, simple but very correct the, a way of stating it. Exactly. So I'm sure most of the people listening really understand, you know, the different sets and rep schemes that you might use when you're training for different goals. But this is quite a bit different than how we typically lift and work out. So can you talk us through sets, reps, loading, and how you go about making those determinations in somebody's programming with eccentric isometrics? (laughs) Yeah, well, again, it's pretty pretty large on this. So um, let's start off with – Let's start off with the number of repetitions that I would typically use per set, because I think this is going to kind of segue well to some of the other components of the programming. Um, So basically, I like to stay within the one to five rep range for eccentric isometrics. There's multiple reasons for that. First off, we have to understand when people say, you know, 10 to 15 reps, and then I say one to five reps, this is totally different. As you mentioned, the time under tension is exponentially larger. Okay, a set of three to four repetitions of of proper eccentric isometrics may take longer than a standard set of 12 to 15 repetitions. So again, time under tension is kind of what we have to look for. And a typical eccentric isometric can take anywhere from, you know, five seconds to 10 seconds. So if we're doing more than five, there's going to be a lot of fatigue. And one of the things that you have to watch out for with eccentric isometrics, and this goes back to muscle spindle activation, we want to avoid too much fatigue, especially if we're trying to re-educate and reprogram our nervous system with appropriate or proper movement patterns. So basically fatigue is the enemy of motor programming. If there's too much of it, our movement patterns are going to break down, they're going to degrade, and we're just reinforcing improper movement into our central nervous system, which is the last thing we want to do. And these centralized symmetrics, you know, they're a great tool, but they really are um, a strong neuromuscular re-educator. And what I mean by that is they can be very strong for re-educating the nervous system in a proper way or an improper way. Because when you hold a position, you have all that muscle spindle activation. If you're not doing it properly, you can very easily reinforce a faulty movement pattern. So, again, you don't want excessive fatigue. And, and again, this goes back to muscle spindles. Muscle spindle recruitment is actually blunted from excessive fatigue. And, again, we want to feel all that sensory feedback that's coming through the muscle spindle so that we can use that to make the necessary body adjustments. So again, especially at the beginning and, and even uh, with advanced clients, I don't like to have excessive fatigue um, because we want to, you know, like I said, we want to fine tune the movement. So one to five repetitions is typically what I'm looking for. Okay. And then, you know, yeah, go ahead. Uh, set wise then. Set wise, you know, this varies honestly. Um, and it depends on multiple factors. It may be something where, Hey, um, I have a new client and we have to work on, let's say, a squat pattern. Um, I may have them do anywhere from three sets of three to ten sets of three until we get the movement proper and basically lock it into the ideal position. So I may see, hey, this, this squat pattern really needs work. We may start off with body weight, you know, three set or, you know, a set of three and, and you know, tweak their position, work on their mechanics, allow them to fine tune their body position based on what the uh, sensor information is telling them. And then we may add a little bit of weight and it just depends. It can be, you know, three sets to 10 sets, but typically I just kind of had to throw a number out three to five sets. Kind of your, the, the, the set um, range is kind of your typical set range. I don't think there's really anything uh, overly unique about that component. 
And we're definitely not using the super maximal loads that most people use when they're using eccentrics because obviously we're going down, holding it, and then coming up. So where do you typically like to start at loading-wise? Right. No, that's a great point. Um, so I typically will go very light, and I'll start people with either body weight or empty bar movements. Um, but as we progress, um, I like to see that 50% mark hit pretty quickly. Um, and with some of my advanced athletes, with my more advanced clients, I like to use uh, a weight, especially for the working sets, of 70 to 90% of their one rep max. So, and again, that may seem like a pretty high number in terms of, you know, holding a, a 90% of your one rep max squat at the bottom position after doing a very slow eccentric motion. But if the person has very good motor control, is very um, in tune with their uh, sensory information from the body and they really have good mechanics, that will actually be very feasible. Most people think of, oh man, there's no way I could, you know, hold the bottom position of a squat with 90% of my one rep max. Oftentimes, if you look at their squat pattern, there's a lot of deficiencies going on there. There's a lot of dysfunction. So the better your movement patterns are, the higher percentage of your one rep max you'll be able to use and you'll be able to use it effectively. Hmm. Well, that's, that's really cool. I never thought about using this to, to clean up movements like that by staying still almost, right? Like you're, you're going to get a better movement by having this eccentric and work through that. Right. Well, if you, if you, again, if you think about it, um, the more muscle is stretched up until the point where you collapse, again, you don't want to collapse and lose tightness, but the more muscle is stretched, okay, the more muscle spindle activation you have, okay? So the very bottom of the squat, if they parallel position just for the sake of keeping simple right now, the muscle spindles are maximally activated at that point. So we have maximal feedback, maximal sensory information coming in. Our kinesthetic awareness at that point during the movement is through the roof. So again, we're basically trying to melt that for everything we can and get as much out of it. And if it's the proper position, okay, and we've done a good job of, of either coaching an athlete or teaching them how to use their own sensory information to achieve the proper position, then we want to reinforce that proper technique and movement mechanics into their central nervous system and holding it at the bottom where you have all that muscle spindle activation, that's what it's doing. So I've used these quite a bit and uh, I, I love them, but I don't think I've gone past maybe 60%. So I'm sitting over here, I'm cringing, thinking about putting 90% on the barbell and trying to do that. That sounds horrible, man. I actually, I did a yeah. video a while back um, and I forgot that I had to record this video for an article I was writing. And the, the deadline was that night, and I ended up doing it at the end of my metabolic conditioning. That was horrible. Biggest mistake I've ever made training-wise is trying to do these when I was already super fatigued. Oh, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, it's it does seem like a high number, but again, um, it's kind of funny. The more efficient you get at your movement and the better you get at the eccentric isometrics, and I'll have athletes say this, they'll actually say it feels better to hold it for a few extra seconds because – um, there's this process, I don't want to get too in-depth here, but it's called alpha-gamma coactivation. And basically, it, it means that the more your muscle spindles are firing and those intrafusal muscle fibers are innervated, the better activation you get of extrafusal muscle fibers, what we would typically think of as uh, uh, skeletal muscle fibers. Um, when you're holding the bottom position, sometimes you'll actually get increased activation from holding it for like another second or two. So you may go down... I've seen this happen with my athletes. I've seen this happen with myself and my clients. They'll go down and they may feel like, oh man, if I hold it another one to two seconds, I feel like my nervous system is actually ramping up more. It's not actually fatiguing. It's ramping up because I'm getting increased motor unit recruitment. Now, there's obviously a point where it will fatigue, but doing a you know two to three second pause with you know 90% of your one rep max, if your mechanics are proper and you know how to um, use all that sensory information and wake up the muscles, then it actually doesn't feel bad. If anything, it actually feels pretty good. Mm. Um, let's also talk a little bit about breathing when you're performing these eccentric isometrics, because obviously they're a little bit longer reps than most people are used to. So how do you coach athletes when to breathe? Yeah, well, <laughs> this is something I, I get a little bit on a, um, tangent on sometimes uh, if I get a new client or a new athlete and they've been told, hey, you know, breathe during your set, make sure you're breathing a lot, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Well, I'm actually not a very big fan of that um, ideology. You're, you'll pretty much breathe when you need to. And uh, on eccentric isometrics, breathing too much can actually be the very thing 
that uh, basically degrades and, and basically makes the movement pattern worse. Um, with an eccentric isometric, you want to take a big breath before you start going down into the eccentric phase. And uh, you will pretty much not be taking another big breath or inhalation, I should say, until you come back up past the sticking point on the subsequent concentric phase. So again, at the top of the squat, right before they go down, take a big breath. They're going to come down slowly. They're not going to be taking another big breath. If they have to get more oxygen, they will be sipping air through a straw, so to speak. It will be very small, little breaths at the bottom, the same thing. There's no large breaths. If they take a large breath as they're going down and during the eccentric motion or at the hold in the eccentric isometric position, they will collapse. And everything we just talked about in terms of maximizing muscle spinal activation, maximizing co-contraction of reciprocal muscle groups, um, making, making sure that we have maximal uh, muscular stiffness and rigidity of the structural components of the muscle, that will all be negated. And um, basically what's going to happen is the muscles will have had to relax to a degree and the tension will go to the connective tissue, the tendons, ligaments, joints. So, you know, when people talk about, you know, not breathing is, is very dangerous. Well, actually breathing too much is probably the most dangerous thing you can do, not just during eccentric isometric, but lifting heavy in general. So movement and exercise selection wise, you've mentioned squats and some other things. What movements can we do with eccentric isometrics? Um, honestly, pretty much all movements. Um, you know, they're particularly conducive for what I like to refer to as the seven major or seven big uh, human movement patterns. And with those, you know, um, I break it down into three lower body dominant movement patterns, the squat pattern, the hinge pattern, the stride or lunge pattern. And then we got the upper body movements. We got horizontal uh, push and pull, and we have vertical push and pull. And basically, um, eccentric isometrics are extremely useful for that. I would say 90% of the time that I have clients perform those movement patterns, they are using eccentric isometrics, again, whether they know it or not. <laughs> Probably have a few clients and athletes, you know, they're going to be listening to this and be like, oh, is that what they're called? So, you know, they're just used to be saying, hey, we're going to, you know, do the pause. We're going to basically tune into what our body's telling us. And I usually mention the eccentric isometric thing, but Sometimes I try to spare my clients from uh, the uh, overabundance of uh, scientific information. Um, but yeah, no, that, uh, um, I think, did I answer your question on that? Or Oh yeah, so the seven basic movement patterns. But um, it can be used for, honestly, uh, everything. Arms can be used for tricep exercises. are really good for tricep exercises because um, pressing muscles typically have more muscle spindles in them than pulling muscles. Not to say that you can't use them for back exercises, Um or bicep exercises, because I, I do. And again, using them for pull-ups and for rows is one of the big things that I use them for. Um, but they are very useful for tricep movements, pull-over movements. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, again, pretty much any exercise um, where there's a lengthening contraction, they can be useful for. I know, Joel, particularly, I've really used this with pull-ups, too, for people, and found oh, yeah. that that's, that's really helped accelerate their development in terms of being competent at pull-ups, even if it's just, you know, we do the drop down for halfway, you know, if, if that's all they can do and then over time going down and then you really get fun when you integrate the drop downs into doing pull-ups up and down. Exactly. No, I, uh, eccentric isometrics when, uh, combined in conjunction with the pull-ups, they're in my opinion, not just one of the best hypertrophy exercises for the back and strength exercises, but one of the best postural correction exercises, as well as improving, you know, scapulohumeral rhythm, um, positioning of the glenohumeral joint, making sure the shoulder mechanics are optimal. So yeah, they're, they're awesome for sure. Do you have any recommendations, uh, specifically for those on, on sets or reps or, or any other tips on that one? Yeah. So actually, um, pulling exercises specifically, um, pull-ups and rows, we'll just stick with that for now. Well, I guess we can just even stick to a pull to keep it simple. Um, the only other thing that I like to add in is um, having a pause in the contracted position. So what happens is the person is at the bottom, uh, and again, that's where they'll get a lot of sensory feedback. And those muscle spindles are still turned on throughout the duration of the movement, pretty much until the movement's over as long as they're doing it correctly and they didn't collapse at any point. So um, by emphasizing the contracted or top position in addition to the stretch position, 
they can also fine tune their mechanics and kind of tune into, hey, is this the right position? Is my scapula uh, uh, in the correct location? Are my shoulders pulled back and down? Or my scapula retracted and depressed like they need to be? So again, um, that eccentric isometric at the bottom actually helps give them extra feedback and make them even more aware of what's happening at the top position as well. So um, that's kind of the other thing that I like to add. So with that said, um, the reps usually about the same. Um, you know, I, I usually don't go one or two reps on pull-ups, maybe three to six reps on pulling exercises and pretty much the same principles, uh, apply. Great. Um, so something else I've seen you do a lot of, if we can switch gears a little bit away from eccentric isometrics is your YouTube channel is covered with uh, a lot of bottoms up kettlebell drills. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you implement those into training? Why you use that so much? Yeah, I love uh, I love bottoms up movements. Like you said, um, sounds like you know, the way you phrase it. I'm a little bit fanatic with it, but no, I, I think uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. I, I definitely uh, enjoy them. When I first started doing these it was a while back, probably um, seven years ago, you know, first originally was with kettlebells. Just started playing around with it. I noticed that with myself. Um, at first, cause I was afraid to implement it with clients cause I didn't even know how to do it first. But, um, as I grew uh, more efficient over time, I noticed they really cleaned up my positioning specifically with pressing movements, shoulder positioning, overhead presses, really increased stability of the shoulder joint, um, teach proper scapulohemal rhythm, really, uh, reinforce good thoracic extension. With, uh, bottoms up movements, the reason that I like them is because if you don't do them right, you're basically going to fail. You'll have immediate feedback. <laughs> it's even stronger feedback than the eccentric isometrics um, because it's, it's pretty visible. You're going to dump the weight if your position is not correct, and that bottoms-up position it forces you to find the ideal uh, mechanics. And again, when you actually, you know, to kind of tie it back in, some of my favorite movements are to combine eccentric isometrics and bottoms-up movements um, because the amount of uh, proprioceptive feedback you're getting, again, is extremely high great way to uh, enhance sensory feedback and enhance movement quality. And then if you throw in an eyes closed component with the bottoms up with the eccentric isometric, um, this is basically, an, uh, I don't want to say an immediate uh, fix for, for movement quality, but it does act as pretty much an immediate enhancer for movement function, particularly in the upper body. Eccentric, isometric, eyes closed, bottoms up, kettlebell drills. <laughs> number one, sounds miserable to write out if you're planning somebody's <laughs> programming. But number two, that that sounds like it's a pretty rough workout. It is. And, I, you know, um, it's not something I recommend immediately because, you know, if you don't do it right, it could actually be a bit dangerous. But this is where, you know, the art of programming comes in. You have to make sure the athlete or client or whoever you're working with that they've been prepared uh, properly before they do that. So, you know, one step at a time. I usually start people, if I have them do a bottoms up movement, probably the first thing I'll have them do is grab either a um, 10 or 15 pound either kettlebell or iron grip style plate. And again, I like to kind of work in the plates and the kettlebells together because they're, they're both a little bit different. But, you know, and we'll do single arm or unilateral, one arm at a time. The reason why I like to do unilateral is because they can focus all of their neural drive to one side of their body. It's a lot easier to uh, lock in the technique if you just have to worry about one side. As soon as they have to start thinking about two, it's kind of like juggling. It's easy to juggle you know, two balls, and you go to three, much harder. You go to four, it's still impossible. It's the same principle. Um, so I like to start them with one, and then you know we may add two. Then we may start to get into kneeling, kettlebell exercises with eccentric isometrics, and then over time, increasing the weight and throwing in the eyes closed. And then, you know, I like to use them for pressing movements as well. Um, uh, uh, horizontal pressing movements like chest presses, uh, whether it's on a flat angle, floor press, um, incline press, really, really effective for um, helping bench press technique. It transfers extremely well. I use them a lot for my um, NFL combine athletes. I saw an individual or an athlete had problems collapsing at the bottom of the bench press, but they didn't know how to be stable. They didn't know how to um, properly position their statue and tuck their elbows. Pretty much I would immediately throw them on a bottoms-up kettlebell chest press, and um, within minutes you'd see huge improvement. Great. Can you uh, break out a couple other exercises? I'm sure people are really interested to hear how else you're, you're using the bottoms up stuff. Cause I know you use it for more than just, you use it for some pretty advanced exercises too. 
Yeah, so I like to use them actually for um, lunging, overhead lunging exercises. Um, one of the reasons why I like to do that is because um, you'll often see people when they go into an overhead lunge that their mechanics start to break down, their hips start to shoot forward, they go too much into extension, um, and they also allow the shoulders to kind of uh, move forward. And with the bottoms up movement, if your mechanics break down, if your hips aren't in the right position, if you don't have good T-spine extension, um, you're pretty much going to immediately dump the weight. And it also teaches great balance. It pretty much forces you into a very um, proper lunge position. Um, I also like to use it on a bottoms up uh, squat, kind of like a front squat. You could do it single arm or double arm, but it, uh, I like to use this a lot for warming up the squat pattern. Um, or just for cleaning up a squat movement if somebody's having trouble, you know, instead of loading them up with a heavy barbell, we may say, hey, let's take these two 20-pound kettlebells, we'll do a bottoms-up squat. And again, that's really conducive for teaching someone how to keep their chest up while keeping their hips set back as well. If your chest drops, the weights are immediately dropping. You'll have that pretty much instantaneous feedback, uh, so to speak. So definitely like to use it for a lower body, a loaded carries, you know, um, overhead, um, you can hold them at shoulder level, but I like to do the overhead because that longer lever arm makes them a little bit more difficult. Again, double arm. Um, if you use them with plates, again, I mentioned plates earlier, but plates are even a little bit more awkward than kettlebells just due to the, the length. If you start getting into 45-pound uh, plates, doing any type of bottoms-up movement is extremely difficult. But, yeah, loaded carries. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many variations you can do. But, uh, um, yeah, I try to use them, you know, as – innovatively and um, as smartly as possible without overdoing it. You know, I'm not just going to throw a client into an entire box of workout. It'll be kind of thrown in periodically to clean up a movement pattern or, or to produce a desired effect. Okay. One other unique training tool that I know you employ as well is, is hanging band technique, which I'm sure has a lot of the same uh, feedback and, and neuromuscular components that eccentric isometrics and bottom up stuff has. But could you first explain what hanging band technique work is and why you use it? Maybe why you use that uh, for some exercises instead of doing bottoms up drills. Yeah. Um, so I think anyone who's listening to this uh, is probably kind of seeing a common theme here. Um, I like to take advantage of muscle spindle activation. Like you said, all that sensory feedback. Uh, can, can, your, uh, internet, can your internet nickname be like the muscle spindle guy? You know, we got like Brett Contreras <laughs> yeah. as the glute guy and John yeah. Russell's the strength doc. You're the muscle spindle. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what my, uh, my, uh, professor when I was doing my PhD used to always tell me that it was, uh, yeah, I honestly, <laughs> and the, you know, I'm going to answer your question with the hanging bad thing, but honestly, muscle spindles, that's the key to enhancing movement quality. It really is. But, um, back to, uh, the hanging band technique, with the hanging band technique, it's pretty simple. Um, you need some type of either iron grip style plate or kettlebell. You take bands. doesn't really matter what type of bands they are. Um, you attach the uh, plate to the bands. Then you loop the bands onto the end of a barbell, and it produces a lot of perturbations and oscillations to the barbell, very unpredictable movements and very uh, chaotic movement, so to speak. And, again, that's one type of way to increase um, feedback from the muscle spindles to force your body to basically tighten up, to clean up your movement patterns, to really lock in the appropriate position to make sure you don't collapse. If you do collapse, if you get loose for even a second, you'll see the weight and the bands or the, the hanging weight really start to oscillate almost uncontrollably. So you really have to do a, a, a exceptional job of using proper mechanics. So again, really love the hanging band technique can be used for um, I just used it actually about two hours ago on some of my football guys, um, for squats. Um, you know, I was noticing just a few things with their technique. We've been going heavy a few times in a row. Um, and I wanted to kind of clean things up just a little bit, nothing, nothing extreme. Um, and with the hanging band technique, you don't really have to go that heavy. You know, somebody who has a 500 pound squat, they can get a lot of benefit out of doing 225 with two plates hanging from the side. Um, and the burn is actually pretty significant too, but, uh, yeah, my athletes love it and hate it at the same time, but a very, very effective, uh, training tool. And it's, it's similar to the bamboo bar or the, uh, you know, the earthquake bar or the, um, you know, tsunami bar, they got all these different, uh, oscillating kinetic energy bars out there. But the, the theory is the same, basically just trying to produce a lot of unpredictable oscillations in the barbell 
to enhance um, proprioceptive feedback and kinesthetic awareness. Joel, do you think there's ever a point where trainers, coaches, if they get into it, even therapists, you know, can take some of these things too far? Like, you know, I, I can kind of imagine some things with, with whether we're way earlier with the, the eccentric isometrics or, or what we're just talking about there, isolating bars and stuff like that. Is there a line in your mind where coaches kind of say, okay, you know, like that's just getting kind of silly now? Yeah, you know, I would say, um, I would say 80% of what I do with my clients is pretty simple, mm. you know, and, and again, I do use eccentric isometrics a lot, but they may just be with a very simple move, a simple barbell movement, a simple dumbbell movement, nothing fancy. Um, and you know, there's no reason to get, uh, crazy about it, but 20% of the exercises, I would say maybe even less, all throw in unique variations. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, my reasoning for that can be as simple as, Hey, I want to give this individual a cool new exercise, um, give them kind of a psychological break, you know, force them to maybe focus a little bit more. But again, it's a movement we've not done much, so they don't have to worry about, oh, I got to lift a you know, very heavy weight. Um, it's just kind of a nice change, and a lot of people like the variety. So you have to be careful with that. But also there are strategic ways to do it, like I said. You know, if I'm seeing a specific um, type of dysfunction or a simple, you know, maybe a collapse or the person's not staying tight, like they should at the bottom of the movement, hey, this is a great time to throw in maybe a bottoms up press or maybe a hanging band technique uh, movement to, to really kind of clean things up. So they're used strategically. You definitely don't want to overdo it. In fact, um, I want my athletes and clients to be able to perform proper technique with simple movements as well as difficult ones. So, and I know that sounds kind of like backwards, but sometimes when you do a very complex uh, or difficult exercise, like a bottoms up movement or hanging band, um, it's so difficult and so intense where it kind of forces the individual to have proper mechanics with a simple, maybe dumbbell or barbell exercise. You don't have to be that strict about it, but I want my athletes to be just as strict as if it was a hanging band or a bottoms up movement. So I want them to have that same level of mental engagement, that same level of concentration, that same type of neuromuscular recruitment that they would have for any other crazy variation that I give them but be able to apply it to a more stable, simple variation, if that makes sense. No, that doesn't. I like the 80-20 rule that you threw out there because I don't want people to come away from this presentation confused and think, oh, I got to, you know, all my training needs to look like this, right? No, like it's a tool and you're using it in a specific way. And like you said, you know, you're not going that exotic most of the time. There, there are little parts where you do it and it's almost like this is a little kicker where you could turn up the intensity or focus on a certain movement or, you know, if you're preparing for something or, or rehabbing. And it's not that this is how you should train all the time, all the time. You know, it's one tool in your tool belt, so don't make it the end all be all. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into some of those uh, habits where, oh, man, this is a really cool, unique, you know, training instrument or tool and then to get carried away. But like you said, you got to still keep it simple because in reality, proper movement is simple. It just has to be done correctly. Yeah. And I really like circling around back to the start where that's what one of the main things you were talking about using the, the isometrics and the eccentric isometrics for is to make better movement. You know, that's the key first. If we can get everything moving better, then that opens up all the doors, you know, for both the therapy side and the performance side. And so if we can have little tricks to, you know, help us get to that a little bit quicker, then all for the better. Exactly. And again, that's why I originally, um, you know, wanted to research and then kind of uh, started to uh, create this specific eccentric isometric protocol. It wasn't for the sake of, hey, I arbitrarily just chose some cool, <laughs> unique training, you know, term or uh, protocol, it was, hey, how do I create better movement techniques and better movement habits in my clients and in my athletes? Um, and what's the most efficient way to do that? And that's kind of what I what I do with my research and with my dissertation and doctoral degree. And that's, you know, after having done that and seeing what the effectiveness was, it's just about applying that in the practical setting now. So yeah, and I think you're right. Quality of movement, that's, that's, uh, that's what it's all about. Awesome. Joel, thanks so much for coming by and dropping all your knowledge on this subject. We really appreciate it. Where can people connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah, just uh, my website, advancedhumanperformance.com. Um, yeah, that's, uh, or I think, uh, or drjoelstephen.com actually lead to the same spot. My Facebook page, uh, my Twitter account, um, 
yeah, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, my social media is not really my thing. I, I get a hard <laughs> time from some people not uh, pushing the social media thing enough that I probably need to do a better job with that. But yeah, those I, I have all those. Um, I may not respond as, as quickly or be as uh, integrated into it as I need to be, but that's something I am working on. It's actually an up-and-coming goal, I should say. So, um, but yeah, advancedhumanperformance.com. Well, that's okay. That's why, you know, Zach and I wanted to put on events like the Global Performance Summit because we know that there are practitioners out there like yourself who aren't the loudest in the social media internet world but are still doing really good stuff. And so that's our hope through this is that we're able to put spotlights on people like yourself who really have good quality stuff to bring and let's bring that knowledge out there even though, you know, your skill set maybe isn't the best at social media or marketing that. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, and I really appreciate that. That's uh, yeah, no, thank you for thanks for having me on the show. This is great. I really enjoyed it. Awesome, Joel. I enjoyed it as well. We'll have all the links to that, uh, and uh, just thanks again, Joel. Really appreciate it. No problem. Take care.